So the title of the paper uh, is Status Traps in Social Mobility and Human Capital Investment. So this is a paper <clears throat> together with my uh, uh, colleague, Aline Butikofer, and a PhD student, Erling Risa, at the Norwegian School of uh, Economics. <clears throat> so the motivation for the paper is, uh, is a particular motivation that also other people have uh, noticed and worked on. Uh, but as we have uh, noticed also, and I've done some work on it before, uh, and that is the, in a way, a uh, paradox in the Nordic countries where there is a high degree of uh, uh, economic mobility. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, there is very low mobility or comparable co uh, mobility in terms of education to most other countries. Uh, so this is something that I have been interested in for a while, and uh, what we are doing here is to particularly look at uh, some parts of the educational distribution. So we are looking at uh, uh, recruitment or intergenerational mobility, if you want, in some elite educations. And there's a reason for we are looking at elite educations, which I will come back to, but you know, these dominates the high income uh, percentiles and they also dominate the occupations where you know main uh, big decisions are being made both in the private and public sector. So we're interested in the uh, this part uh, of the intergeneration mobility of the education compared to uh, more a college degree education. So we are going to contrast uh, those two. Uh, and we are particularly interested in <clears throat> uh, modeling this in a very, uh, uh, what should I say, flexible way. Uh, it uh, uh, takes into account all types of non-linearities and also interactions. So therefore we are using uh, not really status traps as Steve has been using in, the, in, in a lot of his papers, but status traps, you know. Uh, with a reference to, to social mobi mobility in education. Uh, so that is, you know, what we are particularly interested in, to est estimate this or to model this in a very flexible way. Uh, a lot of the literature recently has uh, focused on the uh, skills, uh, skill formation in early years and also the technology of skill formation, so we will you know, look particularly at the uh, family and family background and the wider family, extended family, uh, and also look at, uh, or at least attempt to look at the uh, place where you are growing up, which has also been a big uh, you know, uh, focus in the literature uh, recently. So what we are going to do is that we are doing this in a very flexible way and there are advantages of this method and there are disadvantages, which I will come uh, back to. Uh, so we're going to use uh, one version of a machine learning technique, uh, in particular to identify these non-linearities or traps, you know, that, that, whether there's some particular level of education of the parents or income or uh, cognitive ability of the kids that really makes a difference in uh, when it comes to attaining this elite degrees or as compared to, um, to a bachelor degree. Uh, and then we will also, uh, in, in addition to these non-linearities uh, and interaction effects uh, among different background variables, in, in, again, in a flexible way, uh, we will look particularly at the role of earnings uh, and the role of cognitive ability, and as I mentioned, also the extended family and uh, to some extent neighborhoods, but you know, in a maybe not precise enough way. So what we are finding is that we do find that parental education completely dominates whether you enter uh, this type of education. This is both for a bachelor degree and for these elite degrees, but to a much stronger effect uh, when it comes to the elite degrees. Uh, both parents' education 
are important and they to some extent compensate for each other if the dad has a lower education and if the mom has a higher education they have to compensate for 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 a lower dad's education in, in a very interesting way and there will also be complementarities between mothers and fathers education in a way as sort of like a, a sort of demating type of um, effect and there will all uh, also be uh, uh, interaction uh, effects between income and education, parental income and dad's education, let's say, but in a very interesting way, in the sense that not at low, low education level, but only at high education level levels. Uh, gender is important, uh, especially for bachelor degrees, but we see that the boys, the picture for boys and girls when it comes to the main variables are very similar. Um, and as I mentioned, earnings is not so important, maybe not a surprise in a, in a country where the income inequality is low and also high on, uh, on income mobility, at least, you know, uh, using the standard measures. Uh, not surprisingly, and especially for the elite education, the, the children's cognitive ability uh, appears to be very uh, important. But it's not only that. Even uh, in a way, conditioning on cognitive ability of the kids, uh, the parental education plays a big role. And also, again, in a very non-linear uh, fashion. Just a brief summary of the background. So these are the shares of the cohorts from 55 to 1980, which are the cohorts we are using, uh, completing high school which is very high, more than 80%, and completing a bachelor's uh, degree, uh, which is, you know, for the going from uh, about 20 to uh, uh, 40, 45 uh, percent of a cohort, which is internationally very high. And then you see a standard postgraduate degree or a master's degree, uh, which is uh, goes from 8% to 12%. Uh, across these uh, uh, 25 cohorts. And then you see the elite degrees, which of course is low. And what is an elite degree? I will come back to it, but it's basically uh, uh, law, uh, law um, uh, engineers from some universities or so STEM education, uh, MBAs uh, from the elite uh, institutions, uh, and also medicine, again, from the five biggest universities which are considered sort of the elite educations and also they are extremely hard to enter in terms of uh, grade point average from high school academic high school yeah so this was sort of what uh, uh, made us interested in this so here you see you know the upper left uh, these are uh, children's educational attainment if the father only has mandatory education of nine years. And uh, the next one, uh, also in the upper panel, if the father has high school or completed high school, and then uh, the lower to the left, if father has a bachelor, and then uh, if a father has a master's plus, it could be a PhD and it could be an elite. And then you see the children's uh, attainment. You know, over this 25 uh, uh, cohorts, you see an increase as, uh, in a bachelor's degree, both if the dad only have mandatory education and if uh, he has a high school. Uh, but for the two highest education levels of the dads, you see that, you know, they basically had a high degree of uh, bachelor and master's degree uh, for the 55 cohort and they have a high and slightly higher no. And the same, especially for those with elite degrees, it was extremely high and it still is extreme, extremely high. So we haven't seen any you know, increase there. So in a way, up to the bachelor degree, uh, you have seen a more democratic development, if you want, or recruitment from a much wider socioeconomic uh, background. Uh, while uh, uh, for the, masters and especially the elite degrees 
uh, it used to be recruited from the elite and is still recruited from the elite. So it's very stable. That is sort of, at least that is what we read from these descriptives. Uh, so why are we interested in looking at these uh, elite education degrees? Well, so here you, you see the income distributions for males at the top and females uh, at the bottom. And we see that uh, the elite degrees completely dominate uh, the higher income percentiles, especially for males. Uh, so that is, of course, uh, why we are interested in these, because this means also that they have occupations. We looked at that, where they actually have power to make important decisions. So therefore, we are interested in uh, to look at these uh, education levels, particularly. I'm not going to say anything about the literature. Uh, I could have referred to several of uh, Stevens' uh, papers, of course, with these uh, nonlinearities and other papers. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say so much about the uh, data set. Uh, the only thing I'm saying is that uh, we are using uh, Norwegian registry data, uh, which is sort of uh, complete population data, panel data, uh, from uh, children born in 55 and uh, 1980. And we are able to, we have data on the sort of the extended family, grandparents and aunts and uncles. Uh, where they grew up uh, and, you know, the connection with parents, uh, etc. And then also for boys, we have this uh, cognitive test scores from the military at the age of 18 that we will use as an indicator for cognitive ability. Uh, quickly about the methodology. So it was what I said that we were interested in was to have a completely flexible way of modeling this with uh, non-linearities there are sort of step functions if you want but in a flexible way and, and in many dimensions and also uh, interaction in the, uh, interactions in the way in a flexible way in the sense that the interactions can differ across uh, the level of different uh, variables so these, this will be the main specification, and then we have some extra specification where we have ability and, and the, the extended family. And so we had the father's education, the mother's educations, the earning percentiles uh, of the mom and dad, uh, and the year of birth of the child, there could be cohorts effects, and also an indicator for the labor market. So then in a way we test for whether the estimated parameters differs across the sub-samples. Uh, sub uh, sub <clears throat> yeah, so this is basically what we are doing then, testing for this, uh, these interactions and non-linearities. Uh, so this is a model where we can, uh, where we are testing for parameter instability. So in several of these models, you, you uh, try to group uh, the different uh, education groups or, or family or, or background variables in similar sized groups. This is not what this model is uh, using. It's looking for when you have uh, instability in a, par uh, in a param uh, parameter or a non-linearity or there is a jump. Uh, and then the model is uh, selecting the split that maximizes like likelihood of the function. And then uh, you go back to the uh, to, to the data again, or the rest of the data, and then you look, you're looking for splits, basically. And there will be a hierarchy of these nodes where there is instability. And of course, the hier hierarchy will also tell you which of the variables are more important. So this is a very simple way, a simple way of showing this in two dimensions. So here you have the children, uh, share of children with a master's degree, and then you have the dad's education. So the basic the idea is to look for these, uh, these jumps then, or these non-linearities. But of course, this would be in a multi-dimensional uh, uh, model. So the, there could be uh, different types of in interactions as well. Uh, Elite degree, I already told you uh, what it was. It, it is from the big uh, five Norwegian universities where they have uh, medicine, law, uh, and in uh, engineering. 
And then there are certain specialized uh, uh, universities, like uh, the institution where I'm from, the Norwegian School of Economics, uh, where we are basically educating uh, MBAs, uh, MBAs, which is the big, uh, big uh, program that we have. In addition, we have economics and a PhD in economics and and uh, uh, and so on but you know the big program is mbas you know we are we are producing candidates for the business society but also for for uh, the public sector uh, what characterizes all of these uh, educations is that they are free as everything as higher education is in norway they are as you know the, the, they are public or semi-public uh, but it's extremely competitive to enter those institutions. So you have to, to be the whatever 5% uh, highest uh, grades in a GPA from, uh, from academic high school, for instance, so even, even higher, very competitive. So this is how the, uh, you know, node tree uh, in this model looks like. So this is for uh, elite degree. So you let the, this model run of these variables that I have, and then the model will pick <clears throat> uh, the, the variable and the level of the variable uh, where, the, uh, where the first instability in the parameters are, where the, where the maximum likelihood is maximized. And what we see here is that that education comes in as the first uh, first note or first split point. <clears throat> and this is since we are running this in years of education. Uh, this says that you know if the dad has more or less than thirteen years of education, <clears throat> that matters a lot for whether you your child will enter. Uh, this is uh, boys, actually, uh, whether your child will enter, uh, boys and girls, uh, whether your child will enter an elite education. And what is 13 years of education? Well, so the interesting thing is that this is not a completed education. This is uh, just that you have started or have some education at the bachelor level. You can, you know, let's say you have one year of university, that would be enough. So the thing is that you don't have a completed degree, but you have started on this degree, which I find interesting uh, in, in itself. And then the next one uh, is the gender. At the bottom here, we will see the share from the different uh, paths that are completing uh, um, elite education. And you will always see that uh, boys <clears throat> are attending this elite education much more than girls. So gender comes in uh, as a second for both those with dads above uh, 13 years and below 13 years. Uh, and then you see again, it's mostly defined by mothers and dads education for all of these nodes. There's one exception and that is uh, the 93rd percentile uh, of uh, dad's earning for girls when a dad have uh, higher education. So what could that be? Well, it could be that uh, this variable, this uh, earnings goes together with, uh, let's say, if the dad have an elite education himself. So that that is probably the the explanation. Uh, so to to you know, these are pa parameter uh, instabilities. What we're doing next is to show that how this sort of uh, affects uh, attended uh, education. So here we have the prediction based on uh, father's education and mother's education. And these are the boys and these are the girls. And the lines here correspond to the to the split points that we have. Just uh, two, three things I, I would like to uh, highlight here. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, for fixed education 
of the dad, let's say, we know we are looking at boys. If the mom has uh, only eight years of education or nine years of education, there's a 4% probability that uh, the boy attend uh, these elite educations. But this increases dramatically if the dad has, let's say, a PhD up to 16%. So these in a way that they, they are uh, compensating each other. And it's compensating in a quite symmetric way. So let's say that we start out uh, if the dad has uh, 13 years of education uh, and increases the mom, you see that there is also this uh, six times higher probability. And here you have six times higher probability also, which is huge. Uh, that is one thing. <clears throat> the other thing is that, and, and the more red the picture is, the higher probability. And we see that the, the pictures, so if you're going along the diagonal here, you see that it's become redder, so there are interaction terms. And the interaction terms are nonlinear, much higher here than here. The other thing uh, you see is that uh, uh, starting at the low level of that education and then ex uh, increasing the mom's education, you see an, uh, um, um, gradient uh, in this end, but the gradient is much stronger if, uh, if the mom also have higher education. So, it, and, and this, you know, you see the same picture for, for boys and girls, basically. Uh, and, uh, we can show this in a slightly, well, so this is the same for, um, if you look at earnings, uh, uh, you know, it's not that earnings doesn't matter, but you see that uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the coloring of the map basically goes from left to right and not from low to high. Uh, so it, it uh, so basically increasing dad's education, <clears throat> keeping uh, uh, his earnings fixed. You see that uh, education completely dominates. It's not that education uh, earnings doesn't mean anything, uh, but it means much more if the dad already have high education. So it's uh, so this gradient from uh, five percent to sixty percent is much stronger than uh, you know. Let's say here. Here you have uh, dad with mandatory education and the probability uh, of going from uh, the first to the highest percentile is basically not working. So, so uh, I find that also quite intriguing. This is a diff different way of summarizing the results. This is so-called alluvial uh, diagrams, which are so basically flow, flow charts. So here you have whether you have an elite uh, or not. So it's a small uh, proportion, 12%. And here you have uh, uh, the father's years of education. So this means uh, <clears throat> uh, master's degree. These are bachelor's degrees, high school, mandatory education, and the same with moms. And these are the uh, earnings uh, uh, percentiles. Um, in the US, uh, Chedi with cohorts has found that 1%, uh, the, the, the highest uh, percentile uh, of people in the US completely dominate the 12 elite institutions they were using, more than 50%. We don't have the, the same thing here, of course, but we do have uh, that uh, uh, about 50% of the elite boys that uh, attend elite education, uh, about 50% of, the, uh, of them have a dad with a master's degree. Uh, and much higher again, if the mom also had that. Uh, for income, uh, it's like 30% comes from the highest uh, uh, 20% 20 of the earnings distribution, but it's more, you know, doesn't seem, I mean, it doesn't seem to play a so dominant role. Uh, and then we look at the extended family, what we're doing. Well, the idea here comes from this new literature showing that uh, 
you know, uh, the wider dynasties and the longer, uh, uh, the multi-generation model, model seems to have predictive power for education. So what we are doing is that we are uh, looking at uh, the grandparents and we are also looking at uh, uncles and aunts. Uh, I mean, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's completely dominated by the other variables that we already have shown, you know, dad's education, gender, and to some extent, mom's education. So there's not so much, uh, you know, at least not in, in our framework, we don't really find so much of that. Cognitive ability, uh, well, Sandy and I have done some work on intergenerational mobility in uh, in IQ for, uh, for boys together with uh, Paul Devereux. Uh, and uh, the correlation is 0.4 or 0.45, uh, which is pretty high. <clears throat> and the idea is the same thing as I told you about. So what you do here is that we add that uh, IQ from the military test when you are 18. Uh, and this, this is the extended model and then we introduced this and, and the first node where we have uh, instability is actually uh, uh, below or above uh, the mean of the IQ. This is the standard nine, so five is the, is the mean. So that, that is important. And after that, it's basically uh, uh, parental education, and in this case, dad's education, because it's only boys we are looking at here. We, we don't have these tests for for the girls. And the same thing, it's not, uh, you know, both uh, cognitive ability and that uh, education is important, but we see that, uh, you know, the cognitive ability of the boy seems to dominate uh, more than parental education, but also conditioning on, on on uh, cognitive ability of the boys, the, uh, we have this interaction, this uh, between <clears throat> parental education or dad's education and um, and cognitive ability. Yeah, so this is basically uh, what I'm saying. And we already have seen that the income doesn't seem to to matter so much. And again, we have this uh, alluvial uh, diagrams. Uh, which are nice, nice to look at and also maybe informative. So, uh, so we have the same thing. It's uh, it's really the dad's uh, cognitive ability that that dominates. But also, I mean, uh, in addition, uh, in addition, having a dad with a higher education, a master's degree, uh, is very important. Bachelor's degrees uh, degree, uh, slightly different picture. Uh, here the gender is uh, very important. For bachelor degrees, uh, uh, girls have that to a much higher extent than, uh, <clears throat> than boys. Uh, so gender is very important. And again, we see that it's almost completely dominated by mom's and dad's education. Uh, for girls, uh, mother's education are important, but also we see for the bachelor degree that the mother's education dominates dad's education. There is some, uh, we see some places at the low end where uh, father's earning uh, and mother's earnings matters. And that is, is probably, uh, comes from probably the fact that it probably picks up whether the mom is working or not working and the same with the dad. At least that is uh, our interpretation and we will look directly into that. Again, we have sort of similar type of picture, the redder, you know, the higher probability here we predicted. So these are not the marginal uh, effects. These are the predicted effects uh, <clears throat> based on the estimated uh, marginal effects where you have uh, points. And we see uh, again, you know, this, uh, uh, in, in a way, moms and dads education uh, compensate for each other. Uh, and we, uh, again, we see um, that there are uh, interaction effect or assorted mating effects. And the fact is stronger for girls uh, than for boys. And that probably comes from the fact that girls to a higher extent 
attend uh, a bachelor's degree. So we see for girls here, you know, if both have a PhD, parents have a PhD, you know, almost everybody at least uh, takes a high, uh, take, takes a bachelor degree. Professor, you have about two minutes. Good. Uh, I think I'm uh, more or less done. So and I'm going through uh, this with educate with uh, earnings. And uh, one thing I wanted to say here, actually, so <clears throat> if you're doing the same exercise, fixing, let's say, the father's education and extending the mother's education uh, from from uh, only mandatory education to top education, a PhD in this case, it's a sort of uh, uh, four times higher for the bachelor degree, for the for the elite degrees it was six times higher and it's also higher here than it is at lower end so so it is uh, also these non linear effects there and again uh, uh, incomes uh, income matters but the education again we see the picture you know from the left to the right getting redder and redder and not when you're going from low income to high income so much. So it's uh, really education, the parental education that dominates. And again, we see the same thing in these uh, alluvial diagrams. But we see here that, uh, you know, it's not so focused only at the top. It's, uh, for, you know, you could also have parents, fathers with a, with a master's degree. Uh, Still, a big group will take uh, take uh, uh, a, a bachelor's. In the kids also will take a bachelor's degree. It's not only at the top. And we see that for income, you know, it's all over. And the same for uh, for girls. And here we actually see uh, fathers' education in the middle. They have, you know, a bachelor's degree is very important. But also at lower end, and, and income seems to be, again, you know, coming from different parts of the distribution. Yeah, a again, uh, parental education. So this is basically uh, our resource. Then is that uh, the education of both uh, both parents, both mom and dad, plays a big role. Earnings, not that it doesn't matter. It doesn't uh, matters le less. But it does matter at the top of the earnings distribution. Uh, cognitive ability matters both for elite education to a great extent and also to some extent for, for the bachelor degree, but much more for the, for the elite degrees. We don't find so much of the extended family and we do not find so much of, um, of the, you know, the place or the, re, uh, or the labor market, the regional labor market effects. And that could be that we have been quite restrictive here. I mean, there's always a trade-off and one of the trade-offs that you have when you're doing this, using these met methods is, is that you don't want to overfit. So we have to be restrictive how, what should I say, how deep the forest should be. So that is the restriction we have done. And these are the, Restrictions in the uh, or limitations of the analysis. We could also, uh, you know, in the paper with Pedro and Emma that uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, we split income into different age categories. You know, preschool, early school years, and teenage, and, and we did find an effect there. Here we have restricted ourselves to only use one uh, income measure because here the focus was uh, more on. Uh, the education backbone. The idea was that there's uh, much less mobility in uh, intergenerational mobility in education than in income. So we focused on the education part. I think this is what I have to say. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, questions? Well, some, some comments. Um, thank you very much. Uh, very, very informative indeed. Just to uh, preface my comments with a question, this was Norwegian data, right? Exactly. So, in, in, so I, I, I believe the results. Uh, uh, so my comments about the inference aspects should be seen in that light. 
uh, uh, one's access to education is not so much a function of incomes. It's plausible that one finds that uh, earnings don't matter as much. It's, it's other aspects of the family, you know, parental education and so on that matter. So that's very believable. That makes me feel a little bit better about having earnings on the uh, explanatory side of uh, the, the education. So, the, so turning the Mincer equation up, in a way uh, upside down. Um, so I'm not as much worried about endogeneity given, given this context. But if one were to do the same thing for the US, I would imagine that would be an issue. Now, in that context, one worry would be that it seems to me that you, you're looking for cohort, discovery of cohorts, by the stability of the partial effects, the coefficients. And um, this is kind of tricky because oftentimes, um, um, heterogeneity, even for people who roughly have the same average effects um, on such things as such basic things as education or basic foods, the heterogeneity comes from variation within cohorts. That's where heterogeneity is and not so much in terms of partial, partial, partial effects. Um, you, you alluded to likelihood being used. Um, I wasn't sure exactly technically how that works um, in terms of deciding the stable partial effects within cohorts um, using likely. I assume the likelihood assumed that they all have the same variances, for instance, implicitly or explicitly. Hmm. So, so uh, <laughs> back to the, your first question, of course, you know, uh, I spent my life <laughs> in research, basically trying to identify causal effects. So this is uh, a paper that is very different uh, in the sense that this is a very descriptive paper. So, I, you know, I, I do worry about, of course, uh, education being endogenous. So we have, you know, I have thought about uh, trying to introduce, uh, you know, education reforms into this. I mean, there was a college expansion especially for the bachelor level in the in the 70s that the you know I've used in other settings actually also with, with Pedro uh, um, so, so I do worry about this but you know but I, I'm thinking about this as a very descriptive uh, analysis and then yeah basically I mean that is I'm not trying to uh, defending, I'm just saying it uh, how it is. Um, about the very, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that is an issue. What type of variation do we have? So, of course, the variation we are do, using here is the uh, within cohort across parental background variation, I guess. So, so that is what driving all those our results. So, because we do not find that there seems to be instability across cohorts. It's a, it is a bit puzzling, uh, you know, not so much for the elite, uh, but maybe for the, for the, um, for the bachelor degree. Can I ask a question about robustness? Yeah. Okay, and I apologize. I didn't follow exactly what the, uh algorithm was that was producing the, uh, the nodes. The robustness question has to do with the sensitivity of the findings exchanging the penalty for uh, complexity. Is that something you explored? Let's say that once more. Again, I, I didn't, I, and if I mis, misunderstood, uh, say so. It, it just, in, in these types of algorithms, there's essentially a, a complexity penalty. In other words, there's a trade-off between the number of uh, uh, locally linear uh, places in the in the function at the end, uh, which will improve goodness of fit versus the, the fact you use a more complex model. What I'm asking is about the sensitivity of the findings to the to the parameter that indexes the penalty for uh, increasing the complexity of the model. Is that something you've explored? Yeah, yeah so we explored, you know, different aspects of that. So, I, you know, you're using the uh, ICOCI or how you pronounce it. 
information criterion to that which is maximized. So, so that is sort of the criterion being used. And then uh, you have the you know at least the big issue with uh, with stability or is the overfitting issue. So what we have been doing here, uh, apparently this type of model, especially this type of model should be, you know, should not have the biggest problems with that. But what we have been doing is that we, have, we are not using the whole data set. So we are predicting based on that too. So we are doing several types of exercises of that, uh, of that type. Please, other, other comments? Yeah, I'll ask a quick question, kind of following up on that. So just can you talk a little bit just on your sense on whether or not the machine learning is really how much it's really adding to our knowledge? And in particular, like if there are things that researchers that don't have access to administrative data that start off with these huge sample sizes, like does it guide the way that we should be modeling things in normal sized data sets? Uh, that we take away from this or, you know, I'm not trying to pick on what you're doing, but I mean, like how much of this is just a fancy tool versus we're actually learning new things. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, two things. Uh, one uh, dimension is, of course, you know, in this paper, we are very interested in in the complexities in a way, you know, the nonlinearities and uh, uh, you know, the complex interactions. So in a way we wanted uh, a flexible, uh, in a way non-parametric specification. <clears throat> uh, then the question we wanted also many variables. The problem, of course, <laughs> uh, is that, you know, uh, if you want uh, a lot of complexity, you cannot have a lot of variables. I mean, there is this clear trade-off. And I think that is some, you know, one of the limitations of the study, you know, let's say that we wanted to go more into the neighborhood effects, which we originally wanted. I mean, there is a limitation to that. You know, you cannot go the whole way because then you are overfitting the model. So I think, so to sum up, I, I think there is some advantages of this methodology, but with clear trade-offs. One way we have been exploring this in another paper uh, is actually to use machine learning sort of like a, like a pre, uh, pre step. Where we try to identify which variables are uh, seems to be important and then go to a more standard modeling regression type of modeling uh, using those the information we got from the first step. So I think there are different ways of doing this. But I think people were much more optimistic on this type of uh, modeling than uh, and and uh, you know and then they saw the the clear problem. But I think in our case, I think there is some interesting uh, interaction terms and uh, and not long non linearities that we are able to identify that we couldn't identify within the standard framework. So I think that's yeah the way I see it. I wonder if you can say something about the school to work transition regarding the Scandinavian paradox. Do you think education has a smaller predictive role in earnings or status attainment in Norway compared to the US or other countries? No, I, I, so uh, <clears throat> I, th I think when it comes to education, I think it's very similar as in the US. Uh, I mean, education is very important, and it is very important for your earnings. Uh, uh, you know, that's what we usually find. I mean, it's not very different from, from the US in terms of that. Uh, but income is less important <laughs> in the sense that, you know, these big programs from the welfare state from the, you know, let's say late 30s, just after the war, has been ex extremely efficient when it comes to equalizing the playing ground in terms of income, at least the way we measure it. But you see, when you look at other aspects, let's say what I'm looking at now is the, is the one 
part of the education distribution. Uh, other parts of the education uh, distribution has been much more, uh, become much more democratic. Let's say, the, as I mentioned, the bachelor degrees. Uh, but when it comes to postgraduate degrees and especially the elite degrees, it's not. And what I'm hinting at, of course, is that you know when I'm, use, I'm using this uh, cognitive ability for boys, and it plays a big role, and that is probably also where the limits of uh, politics are. Huh? There is there are probably <clears throat> quite especially for this part of the education distribution, there are probably limitations. Well, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering whether you can say anything about a sort of mating in the sense that uh, you are uh, investigating the role of, or you see that uh, the role of father's education and mother's education plays, uh, both play a role. I'm wondering whether um, there is a, a substitutable or, or you can see that there, is some, there are some implications for sort of mating there. Uh, the interaction plays a role. Yeah, so I, I, you know, maybe I was too too quick on that, but uh, they are to some extent, as I said, you know, compensating for each other. <clears throat> uh, uh, a person, uh, you know, a girl with a <clears throat> dad with a low education, if the mom has higher education, she is more or less compensating for that. But you see also that if both have higher education, you see a much stronger effect much higher probability of attending, let's say, an elite education and a bachelor than if uh, then at the bottom, both, they both have the same type of education, let's say high school both. Uh, so it's sort of been making in that sense. Uh, but it's, uh, this effect is much, this interaction effect or sort of the making effect is much stronger at the top. Th that came actually clear from the data, but I, you know, from the, from the analysis. Yeah, that's nice. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, terrific, thanks so much.